apologies in advance if I sound a little congested in this one. It's because I am. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And, uh, today I'm talking about the new album from Vale Smith. Um, yo. All right. Uh, this was one of my most anticipated releases of the year. I think on this channel we should hopefully already know who Vale Smith is. I've covered every single one of his studio albums he's released in the past and have enough videos on him where I just ended up uh, making an official discography review playlist for him that will be linked in the description. It is pretty crazy how far he's come since I did my first video on his now delisted album Zero All for a Cascade which I low-key wish he would just, like, put up some kind of archival upload somewhere since it's not nearly as embarrassing as he thinks it is. And being way less well-polished than his later projects is really not a good reason to outright prevent people from finding it. But, I mean, that album only came out in 2018 and he is noticeably leveled up in some way with nearly every project he puts out. His proper debut album, Origami, in 2019 ended up on my year-end list for that year and really cemented his knack for high-detail sound design and solid melodic instincts within these down-tempo and trap and future-based stylings, establishing his unique sound within those scenes. His second album, Are You Sick of Being Unlucky, in 2020 was even better produced and ended up as an honorable mention on my year-end list for that year. And then, of course, with his third album, Chorus Gate, he leveled up to a whole different level that I was absolutely not prepared for, including a lot more dance-centric UK garage influences, which resulted in such a consistently exciting and spirit-lifting listening experience that I ended up marking it as my number one favorite album of 2022 overall. It's a legit masterpiece. He did also follow that up with another album in the same year, Rekindle, which was not a level up to me, but more of a return to the level of quality he was delivering before Coruscate, but still very solid work there as well, some people like that one more. But as the new year rolled around, he was already starting to tease his fifth proper album, and supposedly it was going to be a particularly big one, a larger scale project that got more indulgent and stretched on for over 70 minutes. Not gonna lie, that in itself got me really excited. 70 minutes tends to be the length where most of all of my all-time favorite projects sit within, and how long I tend to make a lot of my own albums is 256Pi. I see an hour to 70 minutes as kind of my personal sweet spot for album lengths, where you're going to get better fleshed out and feel bigger and more epic, but not necessarily to the point of feeling unreasonably overstuffed. It's a single CD length, and I'm used to that. Now, I do also know that I'm in the minority thinking that kind of album length is preferable to something shorter. And the longer you make your album, the more of a risk it becomes. You have to make sure that everything going into it is as consistently good as it can be, while also delivering enough variety to justify that time as well. Otherwise, you risk an album becoming a bit of a meandering slog and losing people. Still, with how enthusiastic he was about the material to come on this project, I couldn't help but also get excited for it myself. Especially when he released the album's lead single, Pristine Drifting, which... I do not make this statement lightly, this track near instantly became my favorite track he's ever made to date. This is the best collection of lead melodies he's ever put to record, and the way they've just gotten unfixably lodged in my head in such a way that kept me wanting to come back to it out of context over and over. These are some melodies which are so good I feel like they're going to outlive him. None of the other singles were quite on that level, and uh, I was a little underwhelmed by the second single, sure, uh, when it first dropped, thought it didn't really stick out from what I already expected out of his usual productions. As I did with fourth single, Love Struck, which was slightly better, but in a fairly non-specific way. Although the third and fifth singles, Don't Get Hurt and Neat Tricks All Day, were properly great in their own right too and seemed to act as this album's parallels to tracks from Chorus Gate like Tethered to Us and Veracity in the Warehouse, respectively. With the slightly scattered quality of these singles, I did start to get a tiny bit worried that he might not fully justify those 73 minutes as well as he possibly could. But again, all of these tracks were at least good and could possibly hit even better in context. And now we finally have the album. I've been sitting with it for about a week now, and the final verdict for me is that, yeah, this pretty much lived up to the hype I'd set myself up for when he first teased its existence. Yeah, this album is legit great. It's one of his best and most accomplished works so far exactly as I hoped. 
probably his best from a technical level too. Now, I still don't think it's as good as Chorus Gate. While I like all 20 tracks on this thing, I think I would be lying if I said I wasn't feeling the length on this one sometimes, or I think it might have been even better if a couple of tracks were edited out. Though I also don't think it's in dire need of editing either. I've heard albums that justified this length better, but I've also heard albums that justified this length far worse. It is definitely a bit on the unwieldy side, and I can see that being a turnoff for some people. Also, stylistically, aside from a couple of tracks, it's not really that much he hasn't already proven himself to be capable of. It's not an album that, like, exceeded my expectations for it. But on the other hand, everything I loved about Coruscate is also here in full force. All the melodies and grooves and the crazy sound design and the uplifting atmosphere are just as good as they were before. It's the kind of project that 2016 me might have even said was objectively better because it's material mostly of the same quality as my favorite of his previous work, and there just happens to be more of it. Which is obviously not what objectively means, but it's occasionally useful for me to reference that misconceived pattern in my early review writing for descriptive purposes. <laughs> so, how about each of these individual tracks? I will say, uh, the album does get off to a bit of a weirdly unassuming start with the opener Skip Scarlet. On one hand, very solid track. Lots of bright melodies, warm and sunny atmospherics, thick and frantic beatwork, a few pretty fun high detail side tracks that don't feel out of place. Does a good job of setting the tone of what you ought to expect from the rest of the album. I'm just not sure if this track would stick out to me if it weren't the first track on the album. I've heard him make plenty of other tracks in the past that sound just like this. Uh, Wanna Fly from Rekindle especially comes to mind. I mean, it's a serviceable enough opener, it's just not a highlight to me. Not quite the memorable punch to start us off on that his earlier album openers like Turmoil Medulla and Ceramic Skies were. Now if you want the first real highlight on this thing, it's the second track, Dream State Indulgence which focuses on this much more straightforward mix of garage and house formulas, combining all these glassy piano chords with some stomping house beats and melancholy vocal chops, provides us that uplifting atmosphere in a very immediately striking way, and the simplicity of it all makes it that much easier to sweep me up in it. Much of the rest of the first half of this album kind of switches off between tracks like these, which either do feel particularly striking as standouts, or do a similar sound that, I, I don't know, mainly reminds me of stuff he's already done before, I guess. In My Real Time is another very nice and sunny and pleasant down-tempo cut with his trademark melodic progressions. Uh, reminds me of kind of what he did with his old track Think Lavender, with a more organic edge provided by a lot of these acoustic dulcimer sounding plucks, but also switching off into other sections that have a lot more bass heavy trap beats. Again, very nice, just not really a particular standout to me. But then of course we get Pristine Drifting, which... I mentioned how much that track immediately resonated with me in the lead up to this thing. I was hoping this track would have transitioned into its surrounding tracks better. Even if it's pretty stylistically similar to a lot of these other tracks in the first half, it does feel like a, a bit like a disconnected island in greater context. But I do still stand by my previous statement that this is almost certainly my new all-time favorite Vale Smith cut. This track really just makes me so damn happy, and every single melodic line in this thing is a 10 out of 10. From the chopped up guitar chords in the beginning, to the fuzzy filtered vocal chops in the background, to that freaking drop with the garage beats and those super fast piano lines. Oh my god, it is so freaking good. It, I, I just have no words for it. I kinda wish he made this the opener, like maybe also turn that lead in he made for its initial promo video into like an intro cut or something. But even if it could have been better uh, placed in fuller album context than it was, it's still such a fantastic standalone cut that it's hard to care about that too much. I'll still absolutely take it for what it is. Next up we get Insatiable Laputa, uh, which Vale Smith has mentioned on Twitter is his own personal favorite track on the album for having his favorite melodies. I don't know if I fully agree with him, but it is certainly another very nice cut, and might be the single brightest and sunniest cut on an already consistently bright and sunny album. The melodic progressions on this one are extremely light and comfy and envelop you quite nicely, but what I turned out to like the most about this track was how it directly transitioned into the next track, Love Struck, which as a standalone single may not have stuck out to me as much, but immediately grew on me a lot more once I heard it in context, and heard it as basically serving as a part two to the previous track, switching up some melodic progressions in the same key and recontextualizing them within this much punchier, rusty-esque future bass mix. 
Between these two back-to-back -back tracks, I think I prefer Love Struck slightly for having a bit more energy, but I also view them as inseparable from each other. And ironically, they're far more inseparable than the following pair of cuts in Fantasy Interlude and Fantasy. Two cuts which may have similar titles, but don't actually sound much of anything like each other. Also between the two, I unexpectedly ended up getting into the fantasy interlude markedly more. <laughs> this cut hits you with all these skittering garage beats going over this single, intense, cloudy pad. Compared to all these previous tracks which felt so bright and sunny, this one feels like standing outside during a windy day when the sky is overcast. The actual track Fantasy is kind of just a return to the status quo for the tone of this entire half of the album, hitting you with even more organic guitar or dulcimer plucks, light fluttering melodies, some sharper buzzing bass, etc. It's very nice and well detailed, has a number of interesting caned ups, and I think I might actually mark it as my least favorite track in the bunch for happening to be the track that stuck out the least to me out of all 20 here. But I mean, at the very least, if that's the worst this album gets for me, that's only a testament to how consistent this whole project is. And uh, the glitchy outro of that track ends up transitioning very well into the following cut, Neat Tricks All Day. Uh, which, when I first heard it, struck me as a bit of a Veracity in the Warehouse type moment for this album, which isn't quite as bright or happy or focused on its heartfelt melodies, but is instead focused specifically on going hard and trying to be brain-bending. Immediately smashing you in the face with these intense blasts of synth chords and never letting up on that intensity as we go through some bassier sections and lower key changes, and the frantic percussion sounding like it's also featuring that stock Hollywood sound effect of someone locking their car, and plenty of other cool progressions including some particularly triumphant sounding melodic bursts later on. And this first half of the track listing culminates in Diane Dion Kato Mitsu, a much lower key house track uh, which kind of reminds me of Ice from Rekindle, uh, even more stripped back and understated, but just a, with just as solid and driving a house beat underscoring the whole thing. And I do have to give this track special credit for its outro, which feels like it abruptly cranks up the energy and bounciness of the entire track in a way that it always immediately strikes me as me like, oh, that was really nice. Now, these first 10 tracks have all been well and good, as usual, showing Bell Smith's love for making these really sunny and uplifting experiences, which may land more on the chill side. But after this point, the album starts to take a little bit of a turn, delivering a stretch of tracks which feel like they significantly up the stakes and end up with a whole bunch of my absolute favorite cuts in a row. This stretch begins with New Universes, which may be the single most impressively bombastic cut I've ever heard out of Ale Smith, just blasting you with these huge monolithic cores and intense buzzing bass and clouds of distorted noise. It may border on being an interlude, but it delivers so much of a concentrated punch that every time it gets started it has me like, oh shit, it's really going down now. And this cut is followed by The Real Bright Blue, which I think might be my second favorite cut on the album behind Pristine Drifting, just for how... I was not expecting him to make something like this and how well it went over. Well, it starts out innocently enough with some more light and sunny organic plugs of melody and crashing beatwork, but the mix starts to get progressively glitchier and feels like it's hitting you with more granular details and weird turns as it goes along, culminating in this entire section around the halfway mark of the track where things suddenly get very Outiker Xi-ish. All the melodies go away, the percussion gets even thicker and more industrial sounding and starts flying around in all these frantic incoherent blurs. It is absolutely nuts. But all those blurs of percussion slowly get sparser and sparser as they make way for one final triumphant cloudy pad, which makes one last impressive burst and you're hit with all the most insane effects and glitch work this album has delivered so far. Oh yeah, and there's also a bit of a sparse outro too, with all this empty space being broken up by these periodic pounding industrial kicks. I've always been a fan of Valesmith's sound design, but I was not expecting something on this level of intensity or experimentalism, and he knocked it out of the park. The only thing separating this track from something the real Outker would actually do is his trademark uh, brightness and happy tone of the melodies that are included, and that is unbelievably impressive. But anyway, after a track of that intensity, we ought to have a bit of a lower key breather, and we get two of those in a row uh, that also manage to be really big favorites of mine. Soul Absence initially hits you with all these warm guitar and synth progressions that sound like they're deconstructing a Bibio track, and then eventually switches into another tight garage house beat, uh, kind of like the one on Pristine Drifting, as well as a more standard trap breakdown at the end. 
It's definitely not a track where the soul feels absent, that soul is very much immediately present here. And there's even more soul behind the following track, Waiting, uh, quite possibly the album's deepest emotional moment. Starting up with a buildup of all these filtered ocean sound effects leading into these really deep and comforting piano loops and a repeating uh, vocal sample going, you wait for me. Really nailing that sense of melancholy and longing. A nice reminder that sometimes for happy music to hit the best, uh, it could stand to be contrasted with a bit of sadness. And then of course we get right back into the brighter and happier territory with Precipice, uh, this album's equivalent to his old track Setting Sun. Uh, hitting you with all these layers of glittering chimes and bells and vibraphones going over this thick and almost disco-y beat and delivering such a vibrant burst of energy to really wake you up from the sadder explorations that came before it. The sound palette on this track stands out for being extraordinarily pretty among a sea of already pretty sounding tracks. And then that cut leads us into Sure, which... As I mentioned, was my least favorite of the pre-album singles, and I didn't think stuck out to me as anything special for him when I first heard it. Although, like Lovestruck, this one grew on me a lot more after I heard it in context. It's being chosen as a single ma now makes uh, more sense to me in retrospect, as it is a lot more immediate and likable being placed in the way that it was. The weirdly gritty intro of all the pitched up and down rapper samples may still not fit that well with a much smoother melodic house mix that it leads into, but that intro does still serve as a nice little break from the much more melodic mixes it's surrounded by, and the whole track did, un did end up warming on me a lot more over time as I just found its particular blend of glassy synth chords and pianos going up next to its especially catchy vocal chop to be uh, more easily memorable and easier to get stuck in my head the more I heard it. And now I think it got catchy enough where I could even mark it as a particular highlight in that way. That track does also admittedly mark the end of that streak of my favorite stretch on the album, as next we get uh, Full Moon Above the Abacus, a track which, while very nice as usual, uh, kind of returns to the level of quality of some of the lesser cuts in the first half, I guess. This one does have plenty of nice progression over the course of its five minutes and builds itself up for a pretty nice low-key mix of pianos and synths. There's a section in the middle where some of the beats and vocal chops get a lot sparser and more off-kilter. A stretch of bright melodies ready to score a cheery, overworld theme of like a Zelda-type adventure game. And finally circling back around to similar territory where the track started with a nice, chill little outro of solo guitar plucking. But as nice as all of these pieces come together as a whole and make for an engaging experience, in context I didn't really feel like it stuck out to me. It felt like it was circling through a couple of ideas that other tracks on this album could do better and didn't feel like as much of an important moment for the progression of the album as a whole. But I think that's the only track in the second half of the track listing that I wouldn't mark as a highlight. As now we're getting into the ending stretch and we're next hit with uh, Don't Get Hurt, a track designed to be a culmination of the ideas uh, behind older tracks of his like Tethered to Us and Just My Luck. And while I do still think Tethered to Us hits better in the fuller context of its album than this one does, like Pristine Drifting, this track doesn't really transition cleanly out of its surrounding ideas and kind of sits alone as a bit of a disconnected island. But if you take them purely as standalone tracks, I think Don't Get Hurt might be a little bit better. It's certainly much more full sounding and has more going on. Uh, the lead vocal chops deliver enough of a different lead melody that could stick on my head completely independent of Tethered to Us. The groove is even more driving and not quite as skeletal. And of course there's that entire breakdown at the end with those awesome blasts of bass. If he hadn't picked this one as a pre-album single, I would have been questioning why the hell he didn't. <laughs> but that track is followed by Itinerant But Still Nothing, which really stuck out to me before I even first hit play on the album because it's eight and a half minutes long. Already promising something much higher stakes than maybe anything else on the album. And as it turns out, this track turned out to be an impressive sound design workout along the lines of the real bright blue. Maybe not quite as dense as that track, but comparably impressive as it floats through all these amelodic percussion breakdowns and subtle uh, pitched up rapper samples, continuing to hit you with more and more new sounds, deconstructing itself into a million pieces at the three minute mark in a really cool way. And ordinarily I might mark the lack of a tune on a track like this as a negative, but in the middle of all these other tracks that have so many other like really bright and colorful tunes, the much darker and grittier approach is refreshing in and of itself. And that's obviously not to say there's no melodies, there are still disconnected melodic elements introduced later in the track, including some like Magic Corner Tricks Point Never-E low-key synth blips, 
some piano chords that are briefly brought in for a few points like 15 seconds at a time, some lower key synth music box plinks paying off into this very surreal and dreamlike section around the six minute mark with even more warm pianos and floating melodies that do technically have a structure but feel like they could disintegrate into your subconscious at any moment. And disintegrate they do, the entire last minute of the track is nothing but very low-key field recordings of the ocean in the distance being filtered around a little bit, followed up by a few bubbly sound effects at the very end. Pretty epic, definitely a track that lived up to the scale that its meteor length implied. But it's not quite the ending. We finally close with one last super cheery piano-backed house cut in Sister What, which basically acts as like a credits roll type moment. One last uncompromisingly happy ray of sunshine, and one of the tightest dance grooves on the album. Even after so many other similar sounding cuts, this still really feels like a satisfying way for the album to finally reach its conclusion. And, uh, yeah, that's finally everything on Um Yo. And yeah, this album is a lot, but it's a lot of fun. I had some pretty dang high expectations for it, and all of those expectations were met. Again, it is a bit unwieldy. Both Coruscate and Rekindle, completely ignoring their uh, shorter lengths, were markedly better paced and sequenced than this one is. And there are a number of tracks here which kind of just deliver, I guess, the new standard Vale Smith sound of very sunny and uplifting garage and future bass, with a few cuts that can maybe feel a bit redundant or filler-ish in context. While it may have been aiming to be this big mega opus, it doesn't feel like every track added something as important to the overall experience as the next. But complaints like these feel fairly minor on an album that also has a whole bunch of his best individual tracks to date, that shows him pushing himself into new territory and delivering some ridiculously impressive sound design, but really nailing tons of catchy melodies that, while structured similarly to each other, are all able to stand as memorable in their own right, not even to get into the occasional tracks which do really deliver some great transitions into each other like Insatiable Laputa and The Love Struck. Unwieldy as these 20 tracks may be when considered as a single unbroken whole, every single one of these cuts is really good when taken on their own, and the core sound he delivers on even the least memorable moments here is still more than well executed enough to keep me entertained from start to finish. And while again, I did feel the length on some listens, it was, really was not as bothersome as it could have been. There was never a track where I felt the urge to hit the skip button. For all my occasional issues with it, this album was every bit as lovely as I hoped it would be. It's almost certainly going to end up notching a spot on my year-end list somewhere, and this is yet another really strong addition to his catalog. I'll say I'd mark it as my second favorite of his album so far, behind the obvious one, and I'm overall feeling an 8.5 out of 10. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters. There are some people you want to edge yourself that list. Link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.